Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Let us pray, please. And now, our gracious and heavenly Father, we would pray that it would please you to please let us preach, not for fame, reputation, but to the end that we shall be strengthened and that someone will believe here tonight, saved tonight. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. My beloved, good, young-looking president, Dr. Saul. He looks so much like a student, a seminary student. And to my wonderful friend, Dr. Sweeten, whom I have known and appreciated and loved through the years, and to all of the other distinguished leaders and members of the faculty and preachers and all who have come home. I'm always careful when I use the word distinguish uh, because uh, I don't want to mispronounce it. Uh, there was a lady in my community down in Texas who tried to be proper, but she didn't have the equipment to handle it. And, <laughs> and she got up before the association and said, Mo Brother Moderator and all of the distinking preachers who have... <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm always very, very careful. I count it a joy to come back to Moody. I count it a thrilling honor that has come to me to stand in the pulpit of Moody Church. I was reared in a log cabin down in the very rough, segregated part of Texas. And from the log cabin of Texas to the pulpit of Moody Church is a long ways by any measurement that you want to use. And I am thrilled. I'm thrilled that you're here. And I'm glad to believe that a lot of my friends are out there. And I'm glad to see you. God bless you and God keep you as our prayer. And when you come to California, make sure that you come to Mount Zion, that you ride in my car, that you spend my money, eat my food, sleep in my bed, uh, come one at a time. <laughs> and you don't have to be fearful of coming to South Central Los Angeles. I not only have these four young, stout young men now, but I'm the official pastor in South Central of the Bloods and the Crips. And... Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of advantage in that. If they know you are my guest, you don't have any problems at all. As a matter of fact, I haven't had any problems out of my deacon since I've been pastoring the bloods and the crooks. I'll throw a blood on you. <laughs> it is that fourth chapter of the book of Matthews that catches my attention. Beginning with verse 1, and we'll just read several verses. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. I want to preach tonight or talk tonight from the subject, and I want to talk very personally to you. What to say to the devil when he talks with you? What to say to the devil? And I did not say when he attempts to talk to you. I said, when he talks to you. For I mean to uh, emphatically insert that he talks to all of us. 
He seems to have a special line to me, but he talks to everybody. <laughs> He's there when you go to bed, and he tries to give you a bad thought just before you go to bed. It's the reason why you shouldn't le listen to all these crazy midnight movers. And he's there to give you a bad word, a bad thought when you rise in the morning. And one of the problems that Christians are having in their sanctifying process, or in their being, becoming sanctified, cleansed, is the constant talking, conversation, and hearing of the devil speak. Now, I'm also certain that there is a devil. Uh, he, he's a very real devil. And what I want to try to get over tonight in this Founders Week of this great institution that's known throughout the world for its preaching <clears throat> is what do I say to the devil when he talks to me? And what should you say to Satan when he talks to you? And how can we cause him to run, to leave us alone? You recall, of course, that this passage of Scripture comes chronologically right after Jesus has been baptized. This glorious experience where Jesus in Jordan was baptized by John. You'll also record that the uh, heavens open, which was a thrilling uh, experience. You'll also remember that the dove descended, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit descended as in the form of a dove and lit upon his shoulder. And then you'll remember the voice of God with the heavens open coming out saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what a glorious occasion. Now, try to imagine just for a moment. God gave you your imagination, so go on and use it. Uh, try, try to imagine for a moment this experience of standing in the waters and the heavens open and the audible voice of God. Suppose right now, right here in Moody Church, the ceiling would open and the voice of God would say, this is. Well, there wouldn't be anybody in there left when that <laughs> ceiling, when that ceiling would start opening. I think all of us would get out of here. But just imagine the tremendous impact that that must have had on the life of John and upon Jesus himself, for he was both human and divine. And then that gives me my first point, that you must always be very careful, and particularly those of you who are students and young preachers, you must always be very careful of those high moments of ecstasy, those high experiences with God, those high moments where you preach so until you look like you cut off and God just talked. And the people heard nothing but God because immediately after that, the scripture says, and he was led not to become pastor of a great church. He was led not to preach for the Southern Baptist Convention. He was led not to preach for Moody Bible Institute, but he was led in the wilderness to be tempted. And you have to always, and we're not, we're never prepared for anything bad to happen to us once we've had these high moment experiences. These high moment experiences, we are never prepared for anything. But he is led, and listen to what the scripture says, he is led by the Spirit. He is led by the Spirit. The Spirit subjects him to these next 40 days and 40 nights. He is led by the Spirit. Jesus, the Son of God, is led by the Spirit into this mountainous, wilderness, desert, arid, hot place that we now call the Mount of Temptation. 
I was very anxious in 1962 when I went to the so-called Holy Land uh, to go to this place. Several places I wanted to go. Naturally, I wanted to go to Calvary. I wanted to see the empty tomb. I wanted to get baptized in Jordan. But then I wanted to see this place where Jesus went and was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. I wanted to go. And so I had my driver to drive me out there. And it is a desert bummed out, sand-doomed place. Something like the Mojave Desert or the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico. And there are no trees there. There are no trickling streams. There are no cliffs to hide under from the sun. It's just barren and it's desert-like. And it gets up to about 120 degrees. And it is this place that the Spirit, who is God, the Spirit led Christ, who was then both man and God. It was the Spirit who led Jesus to such a place for 40 days and 40 nights. It's a hot place. It's a barren place. I looked. I had sympathy. I got back in my air-conditioned limousine and came on back to Jerusalem because I couldn't stand it no longer. But Jesus stood it for 40 days and 40 nights. And at the end of this 40 days and 40 nights, picture, if you will, broken skin, scorched skin, uh, lips uh, swollen and cracked uh, because he was in fact human, dehydrated from the lack of water and from the heat. At this broken period, at this weak period, at this moment when, 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 when he needed to be ministered unto, the devil approaches. Now always remember that the devil knows when to approach you. He knows when to approach you. If you don't mind, do it like I tell him in Mount Zion. Turn to your neighbor right quick and say, neighbor, I didn't hear your neighbor. The devil knows when. Amen. All right, keep that up and we'll have a good time tonight. He knows exactly when to approach you. In Satan's mind, Satan said, this is the moment. Forty days and forty nights of fasting, this is the moment. And he knows our moments. It may not be after forty days of fasting. It may not be after this problem or that problem, but he knows the moment. And he has no compassion. He has no sympathy. I, I would imagine in my own life, the worst time the devil ever hit me was uh, the last five minutes of my first wife's life here on earth. The devil came, uh, the doctor came and said, your wife has about five more minutes. I said, uh, doctor, here, would you like to come out of the room? I said, no, let me stay right where I am. And uh, so the doctor told the nurse, just let's leave him by himself. And I stayed in there with baby. I have two wives, as you know. I have one in glory and one on earth. Solomon had 300. I can have two. They're far enough apart. <laughs> They're far enough apart. One's in glory and one's on earth. They won't get in no trouble. But you know, I, I don't know, I, I just, uh, I couldn't figure it out. I just assumed that since he knew, according to the doctor, that my wife moments were ticking away, that I had less than four minutes to see her in, in life. I just assumed that the devil would, even the devil would have compassion and, and, and even the devil would say, leave him alone. But do you know, in those last four minutes of my life, the devil tormented me, of my wife's life, the devil tormented me more than he had ever tormented before. Right quickly, he said, aren't you Evie Hill? Yes. Aren't you the one that has prayed for other people? Yes. Well, there's your wife. Pray for her. Why don't you pray for her? Why don't you stop her? Why would you let her die? You've prayed for people and people have said tumors have been removed. You've prayed for people and people who were dying turned around and lived 12 years. Now there is your wife. Why don't you pray for her? You must be a fake. That's what the devil said to me in the dying moments of my wife. And I literally thought in my mind. No, I didn't think it. I saw him. I saw him right over by the window. 
And I was on the 12th floor, and he was at the window. And I thought that I would just jump and grab him and go straight through the window. I knew I'd kill myself, but I'd carry him with me. <laughs> but then knowing how slick he was, I said, he'd probably slip out of my hands, and I'd end up dead, and he's up here with my wife. The devil... <laughs> The devil has no compassion. Don't run with him. That was a lady the other day saying, oh, pastor, the devil has just been with me and everything. I said, change company. Don't run with him. Don't give him any room because he is a booger. He's a booger. <laughs> so he knows when to come to you. So he approaches Jesus. He comes up to Jesus and look what he does. He raises the sonship question of Jesus. He says to Jesus, after looking him over, after seeing his baked skin and his parched lips and what have you, he says, if thou be. He raises the sonship question with Jesus. Now, Satan himself knew that Jesus was and is the Son of God. Even when he testified later, thou Son of God, Son of David, and all of the other expressions that he made it made, he knew that Jesus was the Son of God. But he comes at this what he thought weakened moment and said, uh, if thou be the Son of God. And you can be assured that if Satan tried to put an if in Jesus' head, you know what he'll do to your head knowing that he was the Son of God. And he said, if thou be the Son of God. He says to Jesus, trying to take advantage of these moments that have been uh, very, very, very difficult, these 40 days and 40 nights, he says to Jesus, in other words, you need to, approve, to, to confirm or to prove that you are the Son of God. You need to settle in your heart and mind that you are the Son of God. That's what you need to do. Because to the devil, there didn't seem to be any evidence that he was the Son of God. After all, where, where were the trees? Where were the palms? Where was everything that's supposed to look like heaven? Where was the crystal sea? Where was the water? Why was the sun so hot? And so he uses all of these circumstances to put a question mark at Jesus saying, If thou be the Son of God. And those of us who are Christians have to be very, very careful about that because at our weakened moment, when bills are not paid, when body is not well, when mind is disturbed, when things are not coming out like you think they ought to come out, he'll come up and say, if you were a Christian, if you were a Christian, where's your VMW? Where's your bank account? What are these little slips coming back talking about insufficient funds? <laughs> Where are you? Where is your water? Where is your yacht? Where is your condominium? Where is your gold? Where are your furs? If thou art a Christian, the devil tries to entrap us by believing we're not a Christian, by suggesting that if we were a Christian, then all of these material things would surround us. But I'm glad that I was fully grown before that kind of doctrine began to sweep over this country. I'm glad I was fully grown because I lived in a two-room log cabin. I could look through the ceiling and count the stars. I could look through the floor and count the ants. And when it got cold, I knew we had just a little heater in the middle of the floor. And Mom and I would gather around that heater. And we had no BMW to prove our salvation. We had no house to prove our salvation. We had no uh, 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 condominium on the lake in Chicago to prove our salvation. But we knew, we knew, we knew we had been born again. And so he comes up and he says, if thou be the Son of God, then I tell you what you do. If you'll do this, everybody will believe you're the Son of God. 
Turn these stones to bread. Simple job. Turn these stones to bread. Now, Jesus didn't do it. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, thank God. Amen. Jesus didn't do it. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. You sound wonderful. <laughs> uh, Jesus didn't do it for several reasons. Number one, <clears throat> Jesus did not need any reassurance that he was the Son of God. He knew who he was. He had just heard his father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And whether or not you have had a Pauline experience where God knocked you down on the Damascus Road, and I hope you're not praying for that, because everybody that got knocked down didn't get up. <laughs> or whether or not you've had a tongue-speaking experience, or whether or not you've been slain in the Spirit. I used to talk about people being slain in the Spirit. I don't do it no more, because I have some hard-headed members that I'm going to send over to Bishop Blake and let him slay them in the Spirit. <laughs> And then let them come on back to my Baptist church. But uh, <laughs> but whether you've had a slain experience, whether or not you have had a quiet follow me, whether or not Jesus just answered your prayers, whether or not any, I don't care how you came to God, I don't care how you made it in, you have all of the assurance in your heart that you've been born again because the Holy Spirit dwelleth within us. And so Jesus didn't need any uh, uh, reassurance. I don't need any reassurance. I don't need nobody to do nothing. Somebody called me once when my wife was uh, sick and said, you need some assurance. And uh, they sent a, a, a sheet to wrap my wife up in and said, if you wrap, wrap your wife up in this sheet, she will not be sick anymore. Well, she died three days before the sheet got there. Now, I'm sure the Lord knew what time she was going to die. So if the sheet had been the Lord, it would have been on time. I don't need any of these reassurances. Jesus didn't need any of these reassurances. And second, Jesus did not want to take instructions from the devil. And you ought to quit reading your astrology. You ought to quit reading your, I mean, looking at your rabbit foot and your chicken bone, getting instructions. <laughs> getting instructions from the devil. Waking up in the morning, talking about, I've got to read my astrology. And then talking about, I need my rabbit foot on. Well, if the rabbit lost his foot... <laughs> And if the chicken's breast no longer has a bone, then if the same luck comes to you that came to them, you won't be helped out. <laughs> Jesus did not wish to take instructions from Satan, and we as a Christian community must be very careful about instructions from Satan. Even people who counsel with us. Don't take any, I'm not, I'm not like Jimmy Swaggart, I'm not completely against taking uh, psychiatric counseling. Now Jimmy Swaggart said it's nothing but going to the devil, but since then he's had to take a little bit of it, so I think he has changed his mind. <laughs> and I think it's for the good, it's for the better. But anyway, I'm not against that, but make sure that they have been born again. Uh, doctors who doctor on me have to testify they've been born again. Nurses who nurse on me have to testify they've been born again. I even go to cafes where I believe cooks have been born again. <laughs> but ah, oh, my beloved, there are several more reasons why Jesus did not turn those stones to bread. Jesus had several options in dealing with the devil. The first thing Jesus could have done when the devil approached him was just, Satan, be done. And he had enough power, he could have turned him into a lump of clay. And I wished he would have. We would have not been bothered. <laughs> Only until we walked in clay. But uh, we wouldn't have been bothered with him. But he could have said, Satan, be done. Go, be done. You're over. You're out. Does anybody here doubt Jesus having that power? He's God. I said, he's God. But he didn't do it. He could have called for help. 
He could have called for a legion of angels, thousands of angels, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He could have shown the devil his glory, just pulled back his garments as he did on the day of figuration and showed him his gloriousness. And Satan would have been blinded and ran backwards. But he didn't do it. Most of all, for you who are students, I want to say, he could have taken him on conversationally. He could have said, sit down, Satan, let's talk. <laughs> Amen. And that's what you students love to do. You, 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 you like to take it on. See, you've taken philosophy, you've taken theology, you've taken Greek and Hebrew, and you like to say, sit down, Satan, let me talk with you. And that's why your head is rattling, because you have been talking with Satan. You can't out-talk him. You can't out-talk him. I don't care who you are. You can have your master's degree. You can have your Ph.D. from the University of, of, of wherever I am. But you cannot. You cannot out-talk Satan. You are not heavy enough. Some of you think because you have a master's degree in one discipline, you're heavy. You're not heavy. A master's degree in one discipline, and that, how many disciplines are there in school? I, there are 80 or 90 some disciplines, and each one of those disciplines ha, are divided into 10 to 30 different sub-disciplines. In other words, in my own field, in my own field, and I have an agricultural science background, and in my own field there are 38 disciplines, and then I'm an agronomist, a scientist, there are 11 disciplines under that. I'd have to have at least 11 PhDs before I would become heavy. And you walk around with one bachelor's, oh my, I'm heavy. <laughs> you don't even register on the scale. <laughs> but some of you think you are heavy enough to talk with Satan. And you listen to him. You want to hear his side. You want to hear the pastor's side. You want to read a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You want to study a little bit about Eastern religions and Christianity. You want to mix it all up. I'm a one-sided person. Somebody says there are always two sides. Not when dealing with God. God is like mama. When she said it, that was the side. <laughs> But he didn't do none of that. He didn't turn those stones to bread, praise God. He did not take him on. He, he did not say, Satan be done. He didn't show him his glory. He didn't call for help. He didn't try to talk with him. And you want to know why? Because he knew we couldn't do it. And he's our example in everything. And he had to deal with Satan in a manner in which you can deal with him. I can deal with him. Because if he had done something that only God could do, that would be fair. Don't subject me to something that only God can do. Do something that I can do. Dr. Sweeten, with all of his history and with all of his noble service, he ain't got no glory. He couldn't open his breast, Dr. Sweeten, until I see his Satan. He ain't got no glory. Glory. <laughs> Our president, with all of his ability and all of his degrees, he couldn't take him on conversationally. Devil would run him crazy. He'd be running down LaSalle Street. <laughs> and these musicians, no matter how they play, can't call down no 10,000 angels. So Jesus had to do something that could, we could do. And I've come here to share it with us tonight because I want you to begin to run the devil out of your mind, out of your office, out of your business, out of your house. You can run him. You can run him. He doesn't have to hang around your place. You can run him out. You can't say be done, but you can say be gone. And it's right here in the scripture. And Jesus said, in dealing with Satan, it is written. Amen. Amen.
that's it. That's all my sermon is. That's it. You're supposed to be shouting by that time. <laughs> it is written. Satan says, as Jesus says to Satan, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. Check it out in Deuteronomy. He turns to him again and said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He turns around again and said, You should worship God and God only. Because the one thing that can run the devil out of here, out of your life, out of your business, away from you when you're trying to meditate, is to know what is written and use what is written. Bible study is not just something enjoyable that you ought to do. It is a necessity. It is a requirement. If you're going to deal with Satan, he's not scared of your philosophy. He's not scared of your arguments. He's not scared of your analogies. He's not afraid of your this or that. But when you look him right in the eye and say, Satan, it is written. And there's a number of things that he is punishing the church of God today about. The church of Jesus Christ. Number one, he's on us about our salvation. He walks up to us and says, you're not saved. You're not saved. You said this. You did this. You thought this. You did this wrong. Look him right in the eye and say, Satan, you are a liar. I have confessed with my mouth. I believe in my heart that God hath raised him from the dead. I am saved. And wait a minute. Before you run out of here, it is written, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And while you're going, let me tell you this. It is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Oh, you got to hit him, you got to hit him, you got to hit him, you got to hit him. Take your Bible and slap him. Take your Bible and slap him. When he takes you down, say, I'm not down, Satan. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I'm not down, Satan. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious because of workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down. I'm all right, Satan, for though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for God is with me. His rod, His staff, they are comfort me. Hit him. Hit him. Get your book and hit him. And when he looks like he's going to hang around in your house, Get on your knee and plead the precious blood of Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus in your house. And that rascal will run, for he's afraid of the written word that talks about the blood. A baby lamb, a baby lamb can chase the ferocious lion up and down the hill and outside and across the meadow. If he just has a little Bible in his mouth. One of the pictures I've had drawn recently is this great big old ferocious lion like a roaring lamb. And a little lamb behind him with the Bible saying, Jesus wept. And this lion is just running for his life. <laughs> don't, let him, don't, don't let him learn all of these rap songs. Don't let him learn all of these nasty phrases from a little baby. Let them learn Jesus loves me. From a little baby, let them learn the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. From a little baby, let them learn that Jesus said, I am that, that, that God said, I am that I am. And little bitty babies can keep Satan off of them if you train them 
from their cradle to the moment they can say, Jesus, say Jesus, Jesus, just Jesus. We'll run him, we'll run him, and we'll run him. When I was first year pastor, Sister Bernadine, she was in the hospital and she was dying. And they asked me to come and to have a word of prayer. And I went in. I was only 27 then. And I went in and I said, Sister Bernadine, I want to have a word of prayer with you. She said, please don't. And I thought she was senile. And I said, Sister Bernie, I came to pray with you. She said, please don't. I'm not senile. I heard you. I said, well, then you're going to have to help me. Because people all over the county want me to come pray for them. And I can't go and they're mad at me. And I picked you to come pray for And you said, don't pray for you. I said, now what? Why you don't want me to pray for me? She said, because I have this thing fixed. I have been right where I am, dying, three times before. And the church got together and prayed. <laughs> and messed up my plans. I said, what are your plans? She said, I'm almost crossing over. I have whipped the devil to the end and I don't want you praying and messing up my crossing <laughs> hit him hit him hit him hit him I said hit him hit him in your home hit him in your marriage hit him as a child with the word of God and the Bible says and the devil fled from Jesus and angels came and ministered unto him and may it be this week may it be this night may it be in your life that every time he comes up if he comes up and says where is your rent money where is your food money you're broke tell him that's all right my God shall supply my every need hit him hit him to the glory of God